All right. Well, hi, hello. Welcome to the total economic impact of Red Hat OpenShift Platform Plus. Now, today's exciting webinar is sponsored by Red Hat with their special guests from Forrester Research and produced by Actual Tech Media. My name is Jess Steinbach. I'm with Actual Tech Media, and I am absolutely thrilled to be your moderator for this panel style discussion today because I love when we get to dig in to these sorts of research trends and those high level impacts. Now, today, as I said, we're going to be part of a little bit more of a panel discussion between some top experts from Red Hat and Forrester Research. And we will explore what the latest research and trends are telling us about those wide reaching impacts of the Red Hat OpenShift Platform Plus, including reducing costs, who doesn't love that, and optimizing business benefits so that you can reach those organizational goals. Now, all of this is possible with an application platform that has been specifically designed to empower innovative thinking without limitation. Pretty cool, hey? Who doesn't love that? You get to reduce the cost and pump up the innovative thinking. That's win-win for everyone. Okay, but before we bring out our expert presenters on here with us today, I am going to zip through a few important housekeeping points about the webinar to help you get the most out of our day together. Now, to start things out, I want to draw attention to the questions section of your webinar console. I see a lot of you already giving some highs and hellos and shout outs in there. And I love that. Hi, Vraj. Hi, Richard, Vanu, John, Jorge, Rod, Zhang, Patrick, Patrizia. We got Martin. We got We got a whole awesome rock star crew here with us. I love this. So happy to see all of you here with us. Now, keep those highs and hellos coming for now. We want to make sure we get to see everybody. And then throughout our day together today, get those questions in. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions for the Red Hat crew, get those into that questions tab. We are going to do our best to answer those questions on live chat throughout the panel today. Uh, and our, our panelists will be doing their best as they are very busy giving you lots of information. But if we are not able to get to you on live chat, we will also make sure that we follow up with you after we wrap via email. So one way or another, you are going to get responses back Back to your questions. So make sure you're getting those questions in. We absolutely want to hear from you. Now, another good use of that questions window is, of course, to let us know if you're having any technical issues. Knock on wood. But if those gremlins have got a hold of you today, the first thing you're going to try is you're going to do a browser refresh. So give your browser a little refresh, see if that clears that out. But if that doesn't work for you, you can post a message in that questions window and the actual tech media team will be there to help you out. So that's your, that's your go-to help window as well as your hi, hello, and questions window. Basically, it all happens right there in that questions tab. Now, if you go one tab over to the handouts tab, you can also find some great resources and takeaways to follow up on our conversation that we'll be having today, including the Forrester Research Report that our speakers are going to be discussing in their panel. So feel free to download that now, put that aside, and you can kind of follow along as we go through, or you can dig in a little bit more after we wrap. So you want to make sure you check out that handouts tab before you head out today. It is not just awesome content that we have for you here on the webinar, my friends. We also have a $250 Amazon gift card as a prize drawing, and we're going to do that at the end of the webinar, the very end of the webinar. Now, you do need to be here in live attendance in order to qualify to win the prize. And of course, all winners must meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. And if you do not have those memorized and you're wondering what they are, no problem. We have the full T's and C's linked for you in the handouts tab. So just click on over there, scroll down, and you will find those waiting for you at the bottom of the handouts tab. All right. Well, speaking of waiting, the wait is over. Let's get into our incredible discussion here today because we have a couple of speakers waiting in the wings to come out and chat with all of you. And I am so happy that I get to introduce you to this incredible panel. Today, we will be chatting with David Friedlander, Director of Product Marketing at Red Hat and Grosna Wichick, Business Value Director at Red Hat. Also, Brent Ellis, Senior Analyst at Forrester Research and Keith Coe, VP Principal Consultant at Forrester Research. Talk about brain power. Hey, that's a whole lot in one place. We are definitely in for a treat. And David, I think you are going to lead our experts in our discussion today. So I'm going to step back and I will hand things on over to you. Take it away, David. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today we'll be talking about the value of a cloud native application platform. I'm David Friedlander with the Red Hat OpenShift product team, and I'll be hosting this short panel discussion. With me today is my colleague, Graznia Vizek, who is a director in Red Hat's business value practice. We're also joined by two guests from Forrester, Brent Ellis, who's a senior analyst, and Keith Coe, VP and principal consultant. Uh, welcome and thank you everyone for joining us. 
We heard to discuss the value of a cloud native application platform, as I mentioned, and the customer trends that we're seeing uh, in the industry and the findings uh, for, of a Forrester analysis commissioned by Red Hat. So I think to start with, you know, what's the cloud native application platform? In my view, in short, it's a platform for building, deploying, and running applications um, anywhere that you need to, uh, whether it's at the edge, in the cloud, in your data center. But we often hear about Kubernetes and containers in this context. Uh, so let's start there. Um, Brent, welcome. And maybe in your role at Forrester, you research trends and speak with customers regularly. So let's start there. What are the key trends uh, that Forrester is seeing um, in container platform adoption? Yeah, thanks. Um, if you want to bring up that first slide, um, you know, one of the things that we see is that containers are just exploding with regards to adoption. And, and I want to start off with containers before we even get to Kubernetes and orchestration, because there's a lot of different ways to deal with that part of the equation. But people are finding that containers are just a much easier way to deploy applications. They, they get a lot of benefits from them. And because of that, you, you see the adoption is, it was already big a few years ago, and then we see 108% growth. And when you look at what people are planning to do over the next two years. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, you know, one of the key places that we see containers used is in application modernization. So taking an existing application, breaking it down into microservices, and then rehosting it in the cloud or in on-premise Kubernetes or container orchestration environments. And if you go to this next slide, really these are the reasons why people use containers. They wanna be able to scale that workload. They have a lot of different customers, they have unpredictable demand, and so they want to be able to scale up to meet demand or down if there is no demand. You have multiple orchestration options. Obviously, Kubernetes is one of them, but you know you can use Heroku or other systems as well. You have predictable deployments. You know the the really nice thing about a container is you can you're separating it from the operating system. You're only deploying the application and its libraries, and if the container fails, you kill it and you start a new one. There's no change to the actual application you only have state stored in the persistent volumes or data that you're putting into whatever your data stores are. Then you have that ease of refactoring and microservice reuse because you are kind of breaking things down into particular functions or microservices that you are then stitching together as an exchange of information to create a larger application. You can then take one of those microservices out and use it in a different application. And so you have this reuse of you know kind of little containers that are used to build as building blocks into bigger applications elsewhere and all of this means that you get a return on infrastructure investment as well so in the same way that abstracting away virtual machines from the underlying hardware allowed you to pack multiple virtual machines with an operating system the libraries and uh, dependencies and then application on top into one machine you get the same advantage with Kubernetes and with or with containers. You can take multiple applications, put them in their own little container, and run multiple of them on the same operating system instance that we you know commonly re refer to as, as a node or, or a cluster within Kubernetes. And then you also so so you get a you know what's commonly referred to as bin packing, right? Um, but you have better utilization, better return on infrastructure investment, both on-premise and in the cloud. And then finally, and this is one of the things that I think becomes one of the biggest benefits is open source innovation. So if you have a platform where you can kind of control the orchestrator that's moving containers around, you can start creating a very customized environment for your CI CD pipeline for both creating and deploying applications that meet your business's need. And so that kind of leads us to, you know, some of the pain points for, for Kubernetes on the next slide. Yeah, and that, that was one thing I was going to ask you about. It's, it's no surprise yeah. that a lot of companies are building uh, applications in containers. Um, one thing I noticed from your data is that um, 
there's uh, a lot of customers are actually modernizing apps or even lifting and shifting and then building new apps. But the first two things seem to be a little bit more predominant. Um, and they certainly are running into some, some potential risks and pitfalls as well. So it's curious to hear, like, what are you finding are the reasons mm -hmm. customers are hesitant or the problems that they run into? Um, so, I mean, like there's problems related to containers themselves and there's problems related to, to Kubernetes adoption, right? So with containers, I think a lot of people, you know, ran into the same problems they did with, with initial cloud adoption. The people try to lift and shift as much as possible. So like there's a way to like kind of pack your entire virtual machine into a container, you know, using something like LiveVirt and then move it to the cloud. But essentially like you, you run into some, you know, similar problems that you might run into when just lift and shifting to the cloud anyway. Um, so abstracting away and kind of focusing on modernization, rewriting the code or going to Greenfield, people tend to be able to use containers more effectively. So, so you, in, you know, generally that's kind of like that second level, you know, you, you, you start by, by running to, to a new technology, then you figure out how to use it better. Um, and, and you start to, to optimize for it. But, you know, one of the big things that goes along with container usage is orchestrating them. And people have gravitated to Kubernetes. You know, first of all, it's open source. So like you can run it for free. There's also a lot of great um, Kubernetes services out there as well. But there's some kind of roadblocks and pitfalls to, to Kate's adoption. So as an orchestrator, it matters a lot where you run Kubernetes because where you run it has downstream consequences. So if you are using like a managed service, say EKS or AKS or GKE, you know, they run their platform and you're not gonna have a lot of control over the back end. So there's certain things that you can't integrate into that environment in order to create that bespoke platform that I was talking about on the slide before. If you're running it yourself, you're taking on a lot of complexity um, and it becomes, kind of difficult to sort through that complexity and to curate it in order to create a platform that gives you the types of acceleration that you want within your CI CD pipeline. You know, another thing is you have to make decisions like how will you persist data? You know, which are you going to use, you know, just S3 APIs, which databases are you going to use, which sort of uh, message queues are you going to use? All those things end up having to be design decisions that if you work with a good partner that gives you enough flexibility, then it kind of takes away some of the headache and you have to and you're able to kind of make some of those decisions for your developers up front so that they don't have to make the decision and you take some of that complexity away from the developers themselves. You also find that security in Kubernetes becomes complex very fast. You know, you're deploying a bunch of little microservices in maybe a cloud environment, maybe, maybe an on-premise environment, but those get stitched together in order to make an application. And also you're bringing in data from cloud sources, from on-prem sources, from other places that have to come through the Kubernetes cluster. And you have to make sure that, you know, you're managing keys correctly, that you're dealing with encryption that all of the data when it's at rest is actually encrypted, that it, when it's in flight, it's encrypted, even when it's inside the actual cluster itself. So security becomes complex very fast because you're managing actually a bunch of different environments that if you don't have a good observability platform, you may not even know what's going on inside it. So these sorts of complexity ends up being, um, you, you have to abstract it away from your developers and you have to kind of push it down into the container orchestration platform and have a team that really deals with that. Um, and when you're running at scale, if you're a very large enterprise, you may not be able to do as much of that in you know, a cloud-based managed service as you could if you ran it yourself. So there's a lot of trade-offs that you run into um, and so you have to kind of make some choices. You know, you may be able to run fast by using a managed service, but in order to run well, you may need to do some of that stuff yourself, possibly with a, a good partner to help you along. Yeah, that, that's spot on to the, um, these are the things that I think 
maybe give customers pause or even if they get started, we're finding that they tend to to hit these speed bumps along the way and that may slow them down depending on what they're doing. There, It's not just Kubernetes either. As you mentioned, there's a lot of things customers either you know, want or need to integrate into it. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but, but that's one of the things that I think uh, is a challenge for customers who typically go and try to deploy this themselves. Um, so we've talked a lot about trends and pitfalls. Um, I, I think that it's helpful to understand too how customers can look at the business value um, of investing in these platforms. Right? It's a new platform for many, many companies. It's something they're just getting started with perhaps or ramping up on. How do they think about the business value of that? And Keith, I know that uh, Forrester has a, a methodology for evaluating this. It's something that actually I've, I've been familiar with for a very long time. Uh, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about Forrester's approach to evaluating business value. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, so we call our methodology for assessing business value total economic impact or TEI. And so this is a methodology that Forrester has developed over the course of many years. And we have done hundreds of TEI studies, um, getting to thousands over, over the years, looking at investments in technology. And what sets apart TEI is the approach that we take. And that is to look at benefits, cost, flexibility, and risk. And we feel that by looking at all four of these dimensions, doing that analysis, it provides a holistic picture of an investment decision in a technology or solution. And that's something that I, I always find useful, um, the, the approach of not just looking at benefits and cost, which tends to be where you know, many companies will start, but flexibility and also the risk, right? What's the, you know, what's the risk that you won't get the return you expect? And that needs to be factored into the decision um, that, that companies make. Um, so I, I do want to talk, of course, about the, the study that we commissioned with Forrester um, to look at the total economic impact of OpenShift Platform Plus. Uh, but I thought it maybe start with a little bit of context about what is OpenShift. I know, you know many folks are familiar with it. They're, they have ideas about Kubernetes or what OpenShift is. Um, so I'll, I'll just take a few minutes here to talk about that. Um, first of all, it, OpenShift is built on Kubernetes. That is the foundation for it. As you, you can see here, um, it is what we build on, but there's a lot more, right? If you go and you, you go to you know, any Kubernetes distribution, you know, be it from a cloud provider or elsewhere, Typically, you get Kubernetes, and you, then you may get the cluster services if it's managed by the cloud provider run by them. So you would get that. But much like building your own car, which is a tremendously complicated task, you know, I don't know anyone who builds their own car. I know people who build their own airplanes as a hobbyist kit thing, which is also, again, extremely complicated. Uh, you need to then add on all the services you might want, whether monitoring, logging, um, pipelines, GitOps, things like that all need to be added on. And you may have your choice of things that you add on, but you have to do that work to add those into the platform. So that's one of the challenges with sort of approaching this, uh, for customers approaching this themselves to you know, choose a Kubernetes platform and then start adding things to it. Um, as Brent, as you pointed out, that's is one of the things that customers run into, and then they may also be limited in the choices that they have um, and to what they add. So about 10 years ago, we introduced OpenShift a little over 10 years ago. Um, and that brings together not just Kubernetes, but many other open source projects um, from, you know, that we then take um, and package as OpenShift. Uh, and what we did um, a few years ago is we, we added to that OpenShift uh, Platform Plus, which basically takes um, that and then adds multi-cluster management, security, a global registry, and a consistent storage layer across all those clusters. Um, so you can think of it as you could build your own car. You could certainly buy a car. Um, but what if you have a fleet of cars? Now you need to actually manage that fleet of cars. So that's the principle of like, how do we actually manage that, that application platform as a fleet? Because it is now going to be not just in on-premise or in a cloud, but potentially running across multiple clouds and even at the edge. So that platform, and this goes back to uh, what we were talking about, Brent, is that you know that platform has to be transparent to developers. It has to provide that kind of unified place for development, security, operations teams, for all of them to come together and work in a, a single environment. 
Um, it certainly needs to be extensible and work with what customers have. It needs to run uh, on any infrastructure or cloud or at the edge. Uh, and it needs to provide um, security, manageability, observability. Um, it needs to provide that across not just the one environment that you may run in, but across all those environments. Um, and, and that's where we see customers wanting that flexibility, but then maybe running into uh, obstacles if they've kind of built uh, built it out themselves in, at some, in some way. And that's what OpenShift Platform Plus is. It's really all of the, all of the capability in one package from the operating system up through the Kubernetes stack and cluster services, uh, the platform services, all of the application services, um, you know, data, the data layer, the developer services, um, and then the the multi-cluster capabilities and global registry that I mentioned and the data management across those layers. Um, so I just wanted to give that context, Keith, before we talk about specifically um, the study that, uh, that we commissioned with Forrester. Um, so let's talk about uh, some of the, the findings from that. I know it's a, you know, a detailed report, but I thought it'd be good just to share a couple of the findings here. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, so as, as we can see on, on the slide, um, we spoke with um, uh, four customers to understand the, the benefits of using OpenShift Platform Plus. Um, so these were detailed interviews with customers who are users of Platform Plus and have been using that for some time. And so we can see the three benefits uh, as indicated. It's improved software developer productivity, reduced application downtime, and avoided DevOps hiring. These are the quantified benefits over a three-year time period. There were also some additional benefits that were unquantified or, or that customers were not able to yet uh, quantify. And I'll touch on those in just a minute. Um, so given these three quantified benefits, I'd like to talk about each one in just a little bit more detail, um, starting with improved software developer productivity. And so how this was achieved based on what we heard from customers is it was through automated workflows and streamlined collaboration, rapid and easy application scaling, and security integration with DevOps workflows were among the, the key ways that this was achieved by customers uh, leveraging OpenShift Platform Plus. And so overall, they experienced um, software developer productivity improving by 10%. And that results in a benefit over three years, $3.1 million. So that's the first of, of these three quantified benefits. Second one is around reduced application downtime. Just to give a little bit more uh, detail around that, the way this was accomplished was by redistributing workloads, uh, especially if there's a failure, instead of having to take down a server. And then by also enabling rolling updates with minimal downtime. And what this resulted in from, from customers' perspective is app application downtime was reduced by 24 hours per end user per year. That results in a benefit over three years of $2.3 million uh, with OpenShift Platform Plus. So third benefit uh, that was quantified by customers with whom we spoke was avoided DevOps hiring. And so OpenShift Platform Plus provided customers with the components, management, and support that uh, an organization would otherwise need to develop or integrate themselves when building an application platform for modern containerized software. And so by having that, that benefit, um, we found that um, customers were able to avoid hiring five DevOps engineers with Kubernetes experience. And these are very difficult people to find, people to hire uh, in the industry. And so by having this benefit, um, we found that uh, customers were able to avoid spend of $1.5 million over three years. So just wanted to give a little more context around um, these, these three quantified benefits. In addition to these three quantified benefits, we also heard of unquantified benefits. And those include um, enhancing security posture, which we heard about across our interviews, also being able to improve the speed and frequency of software releases and updates. Um, also heard that OpenShift Platform Plus enables uh, upskilling and a better employee experience for software developers. And one other benefit that I'll mention is um, being able to reduce IT infrastructure costs for some deployments. Okay, 
Okay. And just to provide overall summary of benefits, cost, flexibility, and risk, um, what we heard from customers uh, resulted in a return on investment of 203%. And that includes the cost related to OpenShift Platform Plus that was experienced by customers. So that covers not only the, the uh, Platform Plus subscription, includes implementation cost as well as developer training. So that's reflected in that ROI of 203%. And so overall, we see present value benefits of $6.9 million with net present value taking into account cost of $4.6 million. And this would be for a typical deployment that reflects all four of the customer interviews, which we summarize into what we call the composite organization. So there's just a few of the key findings I wanted to share and additional details can be found in the full case study, which is a, will be available through the, the Red Hat website to download. Yeah, thank you, Keith. It'll, it'll be available to the um, webinar attendees as well. I think it'll be part of the um, the assets that are available um, with the webinar. Um, you, so you mentioned this is a kind of an aggregate organization. Uh, just briefly, how how can you know, companies use this study to inform their own analysis? How might they look at this and say, okay, this this is what it means for us? Because this is obviously based on interviews with a, with um, four other companies, but uh, you know. Obviously, miles may vary. So, how how should they think about that? Yeah, yeah. So, so even if um, an organization is in a different industry than we interviewed, the study is still relevant in terms of the findings and, and can be leveraged for a, a company's own analysis um, making a decision like this. Um, one of the things that will need to be done is to scale the benefits based on an organization's particular size, as well as what the deployment plan is in terms of the scale and over what time period. And this is where the full study can help. We provide the specific details at, at in effect, a unit level so that uh, a company can go in and scale this for, for their own size and understand what would be the size, potential size of the benefits for them that they might be able to realize. And then in terms of the cost, that's something that uh, Red Hat can help with in terms of building out the business case. And then by bringing together the value of the benefits, the cost, understanding flexibility and risk, this can provide that, that holistic case that um, uh, companies can, can use for um, their own internal use for uh, sharing with other stakeholders. Yeah, that's perfect. And that is something that we do and actually, um, Krasina, that's um, what you do. You you work as part of the the business value practice at Red Hat. Um, can you can you tell us about the business value practice and what it is that that you do? Yes, certainly, David. So thank you. We are a global organization supporting our sales force, and we help them elevate customer conversations from talking about product features and functions to talk about the economic value of our solutions. Um, we want our customers to consider the full spectrum of value. And so what do I mean by that? Yes, these days, savings and CapEx or OPEX avoidance are paramount, right? That's the economic climate. But we also want to make sure that our so the customers understand that our solutions can help them with growing revenue, minimize operational risk, and they can also help them with uh, fulfilling their strategic imperatives however they, they define them. This may be based on growing innovation, implementing a cloud strategy, et cetera. Um, we have a structured but flexible framework. We can apply it to either solution-centric conversations, or we can make it much broader um, to include discussions about modernizing or digital transformation. Now, what differentiates us um, in the business value practice is that we combine the power of qualitative and quantitative analysis, uh, which is where Forrester comes in. So what you see here on the screen is an example of an artifact that is developed specifically to talk about the business value of OPP, OpenShift Platform Plus. However, we use Forrester just like Keith described. We study, um, we provide the studies to the customers. We take the studies and turn them into uh, financial modeling which helps us with the development of financial hypotheses for a particular customer with their inputs. 
And I have to tell you that it is powerful to have these TEI findings as part of these hypotheses. We find this approach to be highly impactful in the conversations of the customers. And, and frankly, I, I think that our value messaging would not be as effective without it. Yeah, so, so thank you. So let me close with just uh, your thoughts on how you explain the, the value of OpenShift Platform Plus to customers when you know, and it, you generalize from different customers you've talked to, but give us a sense of you know, how you explain that um, and take the, all of that together, the qualitative and quantitative benefits. Right. Um, so we use the same um, method I, I described, which is essentially, you know, looking at the what we call four quadrants of value. Uh, and this is, you know, interesting because it tracks rather well, as you can tell, with the Forrester approach, right? When we're talking about costs, revenue, flexibility, and uh, risk. So that right there, it's it's really nice to to connect the the dots. Now, Keith had mentioned a number of the benefits, but I wanted to maybe double click on some of them or supplement uh, what he discussed. We do start with uh, looking at the uh, cost side of the equation, right? So we do highlight that centralized multi-cluster management significantly reduces operational costs. And, and you know, imagine a team, a customer who has their production environments in three different environments. So, so um, on-prem, in AWS, or in Azure. Without OPP, the customer would need to employ higher upscale, employ three different DevOps teams. Now, with the power of OPP and specifically a single pane of glass with pool management and observability functions, right? This can mean uh, employing a much smaller SEC DevOps team. So then, you know, this is the virtuous circle, right? That then means that those uh, DevOps resources can be dedicated to developing more functions, newer functions, which then translates into value on the in the revenue quadrant. Um, so again, we're talking about higher number of innovative features and functions, which drives NPS, which drives revenue. We couple that with the ability to place workloads strategically and globally. So what this means is that with OPP, OpenShift Platform Plus, the customer can place workloads where there is, whenever there is public cloud. So that way they have truly global reach and that helps them grow market share and again, grow the revenue. Uh, when we move into the risk quadrant, and uh, Keith touched on that as well, it is really about end-to-end -end management observability, which is now coupled with policy and automation engines. And these combined result, again, in a much more stable environment. This is then expressed as uh, fewer outages, uh, lower MTTR, increased stability, improved SLAs, etc. So uh, in addition, obviously, to the uh, improved security posture for the customer. And uh, finally, I also want to touch on this other strategic quadrant of value. And again, the customers may define it in different ways. But what I wanted to double click on is the fact that um, essentially OPP is about creating workload portability. So we call it uh, right once run anywhere. This can help customers with defining their own strat cloud strategy. So they can define it on their own terms and on their own timelines. They can use public cloud for DR. They can use it for bursting whenever there's an issue of capacity. They can think about strategic workload placement where they leverage a particular strength of a particular hyperscaler without giving away the store. And in some industries, they can even leverage OPP to create workload repatriation scenarios. So again, um, a lot of these benefits have been quantified um, by Forrester in the TI report, and we will be leveraging those in our um, uh, in the development of our models and our financial hypotheses. But we always catch this in the context of a much broader, much broader um, business picture and the picture of full business value. Again, supplementing what we can quantify with what we can describe to the customers. That's uh, it provides a lot of good insight from Red Hat's perspective as well on how customers are, are getting value out of uh, OpenShift Platform Plus and, and how they can think about that and the flexibility that it provides, right? It, it isn't the technical features um, you know, that 
matter at the end of the day, but it's what you can do with those. Um, so, so I want to thank everybody for for joining the uh, the webinar. I think we're we're just about out of time here, but thank you for joining the panel, sharing your insights on um, Forrester's uh, mark, view with the market, Brent, and on the TEI, uh, the Total Economic Impact Study, Keith, and uh, and Krasina for the um, the view into the business value practice and the work you do. So thank you again, everyone. And uh, we will uh, take any questions offline. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you, David, and especially to Grezna, Brent, and Keith. What a wonderful and interesting conversation. I agree with you that, you know, the, all, the, all the best capabilities in the world, it really, you have to get into the real, real world applications. You have to get into the impact and the possibilities. And I think we had a great conversation around all of that today. Lots of cool, interesting takeaways uh, and, and really excited to spend a little bit more time learning about this research report um, and especially the OpenShift Platform Plus. Now, if you are feeling the same way, if you're feeling like you just kind of scratched the surface and you're ready to learn more, you're in luck because the entire Forrester Research Report is waiting for you in the handouts tab. Again, that's the total economic impact of Red Hat OpenShift Platform Plus. So that report linked for you in the handouts tab. Make sure you snag that, download it, set it aside, hold on to that because as soon as we wrap up our webinar, I know you're going to want to spend a little bit more time digging in because I know we've got a lot of wonderful and curious minds out there with us today and you're all ready to learn a little more <clears throat> excuse me all right well speaking of uh wonderful humans i am going to reward you all for being here and awesome with a prize giveaway so before you head out we have a 250 dollars amazon gift card going to a lucky member of our audience who's here live and present and that person is Michael Dalio from Wisconsin. Roll on Wisconsin, Michael Dalio from Wisconsin. Congratulations to you. We will be in touch about claiming your prize after we wrap. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank the Red Hat crew, especially their guests from Forrester Research, for making this really, really fun discussion and an interesting panel possible and, and for bringing that report to life. You know, it's, it's a great thing. I, I love reading a good research report. I really do enjoy all of the uh, wonderful things that are available in those written documents. And it is so fun to have an expert sort of pull out the pieces that resonate with them, right? The things from that report that are interesting, that snag their attention and kind of lay them out in front of you and say, hey, here are the things that you should pull out of this. It's, it's kind of like a TLDR, but then you get all these wonderful <clears throat> added color and insight from their expertise. So today is the best of both worlds, right? You get the one-two punch, you get the written document, and then you get some experts kind of walking you through. It's like being back in university. It's like cool university class. I liked university, so I think that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, so hopefully you're all feeling the same way and you're enjoying that conversation and ready to learn a little bit more because of course this is just the starting point and there's lots more to dig into. And I hope that I will get to see all of you again soon. I, I hope that you have a beautiful Wednesday. We're halfway through the week, so a little bit more to come. And uh, until we get to chat again, have a beautiful end to your day, my friends. <laughs>